Um, we are this week in a short week. We didn't have class yesterday. There was no school yesterday. It would be a wonderful three day break. I did. I hope yours was restorative and delightful. Um, so, Fridays, because of the schedule uh, conflicts with the uh, the two, the two chaps who go to work at the end of the day on Fridays. We are going to do uh, our three class sessions this week, today, tomorrow, and Thursday, Tuesday, Tuesday, and Thursday. Um, so if you look at the syllabus for what that means, we are coming up to the end of Arrhenus. Arrhenus will be done this week. Um, and so you, we have uh, a lesson on him today, a lesson on him tomorrow. Tomorrow, I need your quiz questions uh, over the last part of the Arrhenus because the quiz for that is on Thursday. Okay. Uh, then the re the reflection paper on Arrhenus is due as well on Thursday. This Thursday. This Thursday. The reflection paper for Arrhenus is due on Thursday. Quiz is tomorrow. Quiz is Thursday. Walk oh, in with your wait, paper in here. Okay, so that is Thursday. And then you are done with Arrhenus. As we said before, this is this is one of the most difficult readings that you will do in this class, and we start with him. Uh, Augustine, who you will begin, I'll, I'll give you Augustine's uh, essay on Thursday, so you can start reading it if you choose to at the weekend, or on Friday when you're here, just on a reading day. Uh, Augustine is much easier to read. So if you're if you're frustrated with the, with the density of Arrhenus, it will get better. Uh, but I hope that you learned some things about some some theo theological truths from that reading. Um, so we're going to continue with talking about Arrhenus today. Um, he made a huge deal out of the importance of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Just a little historical context as to why we're going to dwell on that here and why he dwelt on it there. Uh, which two Gospels mention the birth of Christ? Which two um, Gospels? Luke and Matthew. Luke and Matthew. Um, and so the other two Gospels don't talk about the birth of Christ. John says that he existed before and he came to be, and he put flesh on. But he doesn't tell us that he was born of a virgin. Mark starts with Jesus' ministry and doesn't tell us anything about Jesus before he was ministered to. So in the early church, there were these two letters, these two uh, uh, Gospels that mentioned the birth of Christ. Um, the fact that he is born of a virgin is actually not explicitly taught anywhere else in the Bible. Um, Revelation alludes to a woman who was a virgin and brought forth the Christ, but that actually has to do with Israel, not with Mary. Um, and the prophecy in Isaiah, Isaiah 7, 14, that points to it, um, there is a difference of opinion as to what that word can mean. It can mean young, young woman or it could mean virgin. Um, so there was, there was obviously some question about it early in the church. Virgins don't normally have babies, right? Not, not a normal thing. So it was attested to by two of the books of the Bible, um, but a lot of Christians thought that that was a metaphor, thought that it was not actual history. So Arrhenus and, uh, spends a bunch of time on this. Uh, of the, the 60 or so pages that you have read of Arrhenus, he spends basically the second half of your reading talking about the virgin birth. Um, and so the, you may read this and say, why is this such a big deal? Well, Gnosticism, remember, said that Jesus was just a man. So um, we've got to clear that up. But also, regular, regular Christians who were not Gnostics doubted if Jesus was born of a virgin. So Arrhenus comes in with both barrels blazing and says, no, in fact, he was. And so he brings up several things about why that is important to our faith. Okay? This is an excerpt from Arrhenus. It says, believing in one God, the creator of heaven and earth, and all things therein, by means of Christ Jesus, the Son of God, who, because of his surpassing love towards his creation, condescended to be born of the virgin." He himself uniting man through himself to God, and having suffered under Pontius Pilate and rising again, and having been received up in splendor, shall come in glory, the Savior of those who are saved, and the judge of those who are judged. 
and sending into eternal fire those who transform the truth and despise his father and examine it. Um, and again, a typical Arrhenius doesn't like periods, sentence, style. This is not even the whole sentence. I jumped into the whole sentence. Nice big long sentence. But this is, does anybody, uh, does this remind you of something you've already read or you've already heard before? Does this sound like something else? Well, you have read it if you've read Arrhenius. You have read this, right? This is part of, this is from your reading. But, uh, besides an arena, besides Arrhenus, where where have you read something like this? Nope. Um, we will spend some time at the end of this unit on um, the, on the creeds and the the Apostles' Creed, one of the oldest creeds of the Church, not actually written by an apostle, but written by the Church Fathers, um, is very much like this last uh, group of phrases from that. So whether the Apostles' Creed came from this or Arrhenus has recently heard the Apostles' Creed and is mm, sticking it into his writing, very, very similar words. But um, it is important to say that when we state what we believe, that we have that statement, born of the Virgin. Uh, born of the Virgin matters. It matters to our faith for several reasons. I'm going to bring out six reasons why. Okay, Arena sets the virgin birth of Christ among the other foundational creeds of the church as necessary for salvation. So he says in order to be saved, you've got to believe in all these things, one God, creator, judge, savior, Jesus Christ, born of a virgin. He lists that in as a necessary, you must believe this to be saved statement. And we might ask why. Why do you have to believe that Jesus was born of a virgin in order to be saved? Can't you believe that Jesus was the child of Mary and Joseph who got together during their engagement? I mean, that happens. Shouldn't, but it does. And, and wouldn't that still be okay? Jesus can still live his life and teach us the things that he taught us, and he can still die for our sins? Um, Aratus would say no. You must believe in the virgin birth of Christ to be saved. The Gnostics don't believe that um, that anything should say uh, was spectacular about the physical body of Christ, since his, like ours, is a mistake and a deception. But this does matter. Okay, um, I'm going to give you a quote here. This is from J. S. Spong, who is an Episcopal bi bishop in the United States. So this is a contemporary bishop of the Church of England in America. Uh, and he said that the virgin birth account is a clearly recognized mythological element in our faith tradition, whose purpose was not to describe a literal event, but to capture the transcendent dimensions of God in the earthbound words and concepts of first century human beings. So this is a man who not only claims to be a Christian, but is a leader of the church, he's a bishop, and he does not believe in the virgin birth. That man, Arrhenus would say, is not saved. Arrhenus was a bishop. This man is a bishop. Arrhenus would look at his brother bishop and say, Brother bishop, you're damned. You're not going to heaven because you don't believe in the virgin birth of Christ. And that seems harsh. It seems like, well, if you believe Jesus is God, why does it matter that he's born of the virgin? But we'll see here that there are lots of good reasons why. Five reasons why this matters. Jesus Christ is of heavenly origin. Do you guys have your Bibles? Uh, yes. So, five reasons why this matters. Number one, Jesus is of heavenly origin. Jesus Christ, not just the Christ Sophia who filled the man Jesus, but Jesus himself is of heavenly origin. John 1 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Right. So, it's, it doesn't say in the beginning. Uh, Jesus was a good idea. It's saying that Jesus, the Word, was with God at the very beginning. He was there. He's co-eternal with the Father. Um, and he was God. He and the Father of, are of one substance. Uh, so Jesus Christ is of heavenly origin. Romans 8.3, Aaron, what does that say? What the law cannot do in that it is weak through the flesh, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Right. 
So God sends the Son. You can't send something that doesn't exist, right? God the Father cannot be by himself in heaven. Look down to earth saying, I need a savior, and then create himself, the Son of God, in a manger in Bethlehem, and then call that being sent. You could say he made his son in Bethlehem, but you can't say he sent his son in Bethlehem. He sent his son means his son was there before him. Right? Jesus Christ is of, of heavenly origin. He did not originate in Bethlehem. Nothing about the, the person of Jesus Christ came to be in Bethlehem. His physical body was, you know, gestated in Nazareth and traveled on a donkey inside of Mary and popped out into the daylight. Um, in, in Bethlehem, but that that is not where the man Jesus Christ, the person of God the Son, came to be. Arrhenus makes a big deal of that, of course. It says, for who else is there who can reign uninterruptedly uh, over the house of Jacob forever except Jesus Christ our Lord, the Son of the Most High, who promised by the law and the prophets that he would make his salvation visible to all flesh, so that he would become the son of man for this purpose, that man also might become the son of God. So the son of the Most High, look at these son phrases, right? He is the son of God already. That's who he was before. Then he put flesh on and he became the son of man, prophesied of Daniel. And then because of that, we get to become sons of God as well. So the son phrases are very important. And he became the Son of Man. God did not create his Son already as the Son of Man, uh, so that he came to be in Bethlehem. Another quote from Arrhenus, um, but, he, but that he had beyond all others in himself that preeminent birth, which is from the Most High Father, and also experienced that preeminent generation, which is from the Virgin. The divine scriptures do in both respects testify of him. Also that he was a man without comeliness and liable to suffering, that he sat upon the foal of an ass, that he received for drink vinegar and gall, that he was despised among the people and humbled himself even to death, and that he is the Holy Lord, the Wonderful, the Counselor, the Beautiful in appearance, and the Mighty God, coming on the clouds as the Judge of all men. All these things did the Scripture prophesy. So as Arrhenus goes back and looks at what the Old Testament said Jesus would be, one of the things that the Old Testament said Jesus would be is born of a virgin. Um, and he did that. And all these other things the, the Old Testament said of him, he did as well. So he fulfilled all of these. And we need to understand that, that Jesus entered the earth in fulfillment of prophecy. God the Father didn't just randomly say, now's a good time, I'll pick that dude. And and he'll save the world. Uh, even the entrance of Jesus Christ into the physical world uh, was in fulfillment. Okay? Jesus Christ had a sinless nature, and that is only possible because of the virgin birth. So Romans 5.12. John, could you read that for us? Um, Therefore, just as the, through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. Right. Um, uh, I think, read one more verse. I might not, I shouldn't have stopped you. I think we should keep going there. Sorry. I might have looked down where it started. For until the law of sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Okay, so, um, sin came through one man, and then left because of one man. Um, the reconciliation. Therefore, so. so uh, Right. 
idea. Um, the rest of that chapter, Romans 5, deals with this as well. But it is important to understand that sin came into the world through Adam. And because of Adam's sin, we have all sinned. So the reason that Cain and Abel and Seth and the other sons and daughters of Adam, whose names aren't in Scripture, the reason that they all sinned is because they were sinners from birth. And their father's sin nature showed up and blossomed in their hearts. So they sinned by their own choice, but they sinned because they are sinners. And so you sin by your own choice. You can't point your finger to mom and dad and say it's your fault. You sin because of your own choice, but you sin because you are a sinner. And you are a sinner because you are an heir of the sinfulness of Adam. So it's important to say that death reigns from Adam to everyone except Jesus. Something about the virgin birth excludes him from, this, from the prior inclination to sin, from the sin nature. I don't want to get too formulaic and say that sin passes in sperm, but that's kind of the idea. The seed. Right? The seed of man, the seed of Adam, carries with it not just 23 chromosomes and the ability to make an egg turn into a baby, but carries with it the sin nature. And so when Eve was, was given a pregnancy by the Holy Spirit, there was none of that sinful seed involved, right? Uh, and so, so that's, that's kind of where we're going with this. 1 Peter 2.22. You were there, good, because yeah. I was there, and then I turned it to look at Romans. Go, 1 Peter 2.22. Who, when Jesus committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mind? Right. So Jesus was sinless, and that is part of the foundational truths of Jesus that we need to believe in order to be saved. Um, and it's tied to the fact that he was born of a virgin. Um, 1 John 3.12 says, that's 13, there's 12. We should not be like Cain, who was the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Um, and so the idea here is that Cain was a sinner because he was a sinner, and that was his evil nature. But Jesus has been excluded from that evil, sinful nature, and that is tied to the fact that he was born of a virgin. Okay, so another quote from Moretus, For as by the disobedience of the one man who was originally molded from virgin soil, the many were made sinners and forfeited life, so was it necessary that by the obedience of one man who was originally born from a virgin, many should be justified and receive salvation. So um, Arrhenius is basically paraphrasing Romans 5, and he is emphasizing the importance of the virgin birth. The one man from virgin soil became a sinner. Another man from virgin heavenly creation um, is, is the bringer of life, right? Um, third reason why the virgin birth is very important, is that Jesus Christ is a pure sacrifice. Um, Aaron, could you look up Galatians 4, 4 and 5? And John, could you look up 2 Corinthians 5, 21? And I'll pause here for just a moment. Okay, Galatians 4, 4 and 5. It says, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, and we might receive the adoption of son. Okay, so um, the, that verse, born of a woman and born under the law, uh, the, the fact that Jesus is the child of Mary and not of Joseph shows up several times in, in phrases like that about, it doesn't say what she read, not the son of Joseph, but it does say born of a woman. Well, we're all born of women, right? All of us have a mother. Nobody's dad went to the operating room. They pulled out you, right? Praise Jesus. Um, but what's important there is that is they're emphasizing the fact that Joseph had nothing to do with it. That um, Mary alone is the parent of Jesus, biologically speaking. Um, oftentimes, Jesus referred to the son of Mary, um, and 
And in that culture, you would refer to somebody by their dad's name. And a couple of times, people in, in the crowd say, is this not the son of Joseph? But whenever, theologically, we're talking about the sonship of Jesus and whose son he is, they'll say he's the son of God, and they'll say he's the son of Mary. Um, and so uh, that verse is an example of that. And his, his identity as being the son of only his mother, the virgin conception of his mother, um, is, is important and tied to the fact that he is a pure sacrifice. The fact that he does not carry the sin seed of Adam in his heritage means that he is a spotless lamb. Sacrific sacrificial lambs have to be without blemish, without spot, without mark. And Jesus is that spiritually because he is uh, perfect and clean and without original sin. So he can be a pure sacrifice. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we may become the righteousness of God in Right. This is the great exchange, right? This is me wearing my nastiness, walking up to Christ wearing his righteousness. And Christ takes his righteousness off and hands it to me, and in return I give him my nastiness, and he has to wear it. And I get to wear his righteousness, right? It's, it's, it's an, a garment exchange, but the garment is more than just a garment. It's the garment of damnation and sin that I wear. And Christ suffers on my behalf, and he gives me the righteousness of him as the Son of God, and I get to wear that. And Christ can only do that because he has that garment of righteousness and the garment of unspoiled son, sonship. And if, if that weren't the case, if he wore physical sin, if he had a sin nature, he would not be able to hand me perfect righteousness. I would receive from him something perhaps cleaner than I was, but still not righteous. And, and that, that doesn't work for salvation. Jesus has to be perfectly righteous, the perfect sacrifice, in order to make that exchange with me, right? And the virgin birth is tied into that. Here's another quote from Irenaeus, but uh, Simeon also he who had received an in, uh, intimation from the Holy Ghost that he should not see death until he first had beheld Christ Jesus, taking him the first begotten of the Virgin into his hands, blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, because mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all the people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Confessing thus that the infant whom he was holding in his hands, Jesus, born of Mary, was Christ himself, the Son of God, the light of all, the glory of Israel itself, and the peace and refreshing of those who had fallen asleep. Uh, so it's important, in order for Christ to be the Son of God and the light of the glory of Israel and the refreshing of those who have died, in order for those phrases to be worked out and be realized and be true, Jesus must be born of, of Mary only, not born of Joseph. Because Joseph would impart the sin nature into, the, into the, the personhood of Jesus Christ, which would disqualify him from being the Son of God and the sacrificial man. So the, the virgin birth is tied to so many aspects that are critical for our faith. Um, another quote from Ray is, those who assert that he was simply a mere man begotten by Joseph, remaining in the bondage of the old disobedience, are in a state of death, having been not as yet joined to the word of God the Father, nor receiving liberty through the Son, as he does himself declare, if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. But being ignorant of him, who from the virgin is Emmanuel, they are deprived of his gift, which is eternal life and do not receive the incorruptible word. They remain in mortal flesh and are debtors to death, not obtaining the antidote of life. So again, it is, it is critical that you believe that Jesus Christ is from the Virgin and God with us. This is a reference back to Isaiah 7, 14. If you don't believe that Jesus is born from the Virgin, then he cannot be God with us. And that means that his death was just his own death. And his death does nothing. Okay, so again, this bishop who we are reading 
would look at the bishop who I quoted you and say, my friend, my fellow bishop, you're damned. You're going to hell. You do not believe the right thing about Jesus. And if Jesus is who you think he is, then he can't save you. Okay. Number four, it specifies that Jesus is the only possible Messiah. Micah 7.14, we've alluded to it several times, uh, and I don't need to go there. Micah 7.14 says, let me start it, but you, O Bethlehem, of Ephratah, too small among the tribes of Judah, out of you will... Oh, no, I'm quoting Micah. One time. Never mind. Never mind. Wow, that was bad. See, reported mistake. That was quoting, that was Micah, not, not Isaiah. Isaiah 7 14 says, uh, The Lord himself will give you a son. A virgin will conceive and bear a son. He will call his name Emmanuel. And Matthew then translates for us that that means God. Knows. Wow, I misquoted the wrong one. 7 14 is talking about the fact that Jesus Christ will come from a virgin. So, my mistake is I saw Micah because that's a title that should say Isaiah 7.14. Isaiah 7.14. Micah 7.14 that made me think of the best one. Um, it is the most specific prophecy in the Old Testament about who the Messiah would be. There are prophecies that he would be a Jew, right? That he would come from Abraham's seed. Well, millions and tens of millions and hundreds of millions of Jews out there. So if the only thing we know is that Messiah is a Jew, we don't know who he is. Um, then it says Messiah will be from the clan of Judah, from the tribe of Judah. And again, millions and tens of millions and probably hundreds of millions of Judites out there. If all we know is that he's a descendant of Judah, we don't know who he is. Then it tells us later that he's the son of David. Well, that narrows it down. The heirs of David are a much smaller group than the clans of Judah. But still, by this point, we're probably talking about hundreds of thousands of descendants of David, especially considering how many wives he had and how many children he had. And then you look at how many grandchildren, because Solomon had 700 wives. Oh my goodness. Lots of people could be Messiah if all we know is it's David's descendant. The Bible tells us he'll be born in Bethlehem, which I started in this quote. And you're like, okay, cool. He's born in Bethlehem, but Bethlehem's a city. How many people have been born in Bethlehem in the last, you know, 3,000 years? Lots of people. So who knows who Messiah is? But then there's this one verse that says he'll be born of a virgin. And all of a sudden, the population gets shrunk down to one. There's one person who's been born of a virgin. And that is Jesus Christ. And so it is absolutely critical that you believe that the virgin birth was part of Messiah, uh, Messiah's prophecy. If you don't believe that, then you don't necessarily know that Jesus is the Messiah, maybe it wasn't. Maybe maybe it's somebody else who also was of the clan of Judah and born in Bethlehem, which would be lots of people. Okay? So it is the most specific Old Testament prophecy about who Messiah would be. And when we believe it and when we use that in our description of who the Messiah will be, Jesus is the only answer. Okay? Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is God with us clearly signifying that both the promise made to the fathers had been accomplished, that the Son of God was born of a virgin, and that he himself was Christ the Savior, whom the prophets had foretold, not as these men assert that Jesus was he who was born of Mary, but that Christ was he who descended from above. Matthew might certainly have said, now the birth of Jesus was on this wise, but the Holy Ghost, foreseeing the corruptors of the truth and guarding guarding by anticipation against their deceit, says by Matthew, but the birth of Christ was on this wise, and that he is Emmanuel, lest perchance we might consider him as a mere man. So, Arenas says, the Holy Spirit made Matthew say the birth of Christ is this, not that Christ is some other heavenly entity that filled Jesus, but the birth of Jesus uh, is specified as being the birth of Christ of a virgin, and it can only be Jesus. Jesus is the only one. Born of the virgin. One more quote. He therefore, the Son of God our Lord, being word of the Father and the Son of Man, since he had a generation as to his human nature from Mary, who was descended from mankind and who was herself a human being, was made the Son of Man. Wherefore also the Lord himself gave us a sign in the depth below and in the height above, which man did not ask for, 
because he never expected that a virgin would conceive, or that it was possible that one remaining a virgin could bring forth a son, and that what was thus born should be God with us, and descend to those things which are of the earth beneath, seeking the sheep which had perished, which was indeed his own peculiar handiwork, and ascend to the height above, offering and commending to his Father that human nature which had been found making his own person the first fruits of the resurrection. So uh, nobody thought that a virgin would conceive and bear a son. God himself gives us the sign in Isaiah that says, the, the Lord himself will give you a sign because Isaiah's the offering a sign to the king, the king says, I'm not going to ask a sign. Isaiah says, well, God will give you the sign. The virgin will conceive and bear a son. So that, that is so beyond our expectation that it makes it absolutely certain that the only one who can fulfill that is Messiah. Okay? Lastly, the importance of the virgin birth is that the Bible says so. The Bible says so. The Bible says that, that Jesus will be born of a virgin in Isaiah 7, 14. Um, and we have to be able to rely on the Word of God. If you can't trust and rely on the Word of God, and if you start to doubt things that seem incredible, then you are at a slippery slope. Because it's the, it's the same thing with creation. If you struggle with Genesis 1-1, that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, the rest of the Bible is not going to work for you. You have to believe that God created the heavens and the earth in order for the rest of it to work. Same thing if you struggle with Isaiah 7-14, that a virgin can be born, she can give birth to a child, then, then the rest of Jesus is not going to work for you. You have to start there. And if you question the Bible at one point, you will question the Bible at other points. Okay? And so um, 2 Samuel 7, 28. I will look that up. John, would you look up Psalm 33, 4? John? Hello. Would you look up Psalm 33, 4? And Aaron, would you look up Revelation 22, 6? 2 Samuel 728. All right. Oh, Okay, 2 Samuel 7.28 says, And now, O Lord God, you are God, and your words are true, and you have promised this good thing to your servant. Um, we have to be able to trust the word of God to be what it says, right? 2 Samuel 7.28, Psalm 33.4 says, For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his word is done in faithfulness. The word of the Lord is upright. You have to be able to trust the Bible, to trust what it says, to believe the Word of God. Revelation 22, 6. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the Holy Prophet sent his angel to show his servants the things which he has shown these things. Right. This word is faithful and true. You can trust the Bible. If the Bible says something about Jesus, then it's true about Jesus. And you have to be in a place in your faith where you believe that. If you start to question what the Word of God says, then you are no longer submitted to the Word of God. It is no longer above you, and you are no longer looking to it for truth. You are instead standing above it and saying, I am greater than you, and I can decide if what you've said is true. As soon as that orientation happens, you've lost, you've lost a right belief in God. And, and that means that you are believing that you are on equal plane with God and can judge His Word or even worse, that you're higher than God and can determine if what he has said is good. So we have to maintain this orientation where the word of God is above us, and we look to the word of God for truth, and we believe what it says, right? And the word of God says that Jesus was born of a virgin, and the word of God says that God created the heavens and the earth. So we have to trust it. We have to believe it. Okay? There you go. That's why Arenas made such a big deal out of it, and we must as well. Any questions?